last lecture we ended with a fictitious sophomore physics Earth, a picture there, uh, that um, we're going to use today to develop the uh, orbital mechanics uh, for mainly the inside of the sophomore physics Earth. And uh, in the process of doing that, we'll be developing some geometry of elliptical orbits. The first thing to prove, of course, is that it is an elliptical orbit. Now, the, the two uh, symmetry uh, fields, the two fields that are the most famous for physics and also the ones we can do analytically, the harmonic oscillator, but in particular the isotropic harmonic oscillator, IHO, uh, written at the top of that um, screen right there, um, is the, uh, the the highest symmetry. It has a symmetry of unitary three, which doesn't mean much to you right now if you haven't studied group theory, but we'll be uh, coming at that uh, later on in the course. But for this review section, I want to do the most elementary derivations of various things that uh, happen uh, in to those orbits and point out some interesting uh, size as well. But while we're doing that, while we get the geometry of uh, the solutions to uh, this one, and in passing I'm going to, and as I says, they're derived in uh, unit 5. Um, we won't deal with the uh, intricacies of the Coulomb potential, which has the uh, sort of opposing symmetry on the orthogonal group in four dimensions uh, makes it possible to solve that one analytically and also do geometry with it exactly. So we're mainly going to just derive the things that have to do with uh, the sophomore physics or the, the, uh, the <coughs> isotropic uh, harmonic oscillator. Now the ellipse geometry that does all of that also lets us uh, introduce the geometry of quadratic forms. And we've already dealt with quadratic form in the very first lecture, but this, this one is more general and uh, has to do with, um, I mean, connects very nicely with this. Uh, the, 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 the things that are here are, are, are very uh, sort of sneaky derivations, but they're uh, very, uh, very quite, quite clear. Uh, this is a little more wonky. Uh, this stuff uh, down here. I apologize for doing the wonky stuff second when you're already exhausted from maybe doing this first part. But in any way, um, that is the best way I found uh, to set this particular lecture up. And uh, so let's just go ahead with it. Now, um, as usual, there are some uh, links here uh, to some things that we'll do later. Uh, there are more distantly connected with what we're doing here. But in any case, uh, the basic idea of this particular uh, in, uh, isotropic harmonic oscillator that uh, we get, if we have a uniform, a uniform uh, gravitational body or a uniform electrostatic uh, collection of, 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 of uniform density charge, the idea of this, this is the uh, one-dimensional uh, force law and we've scaled everything to geometrical units so this is a really neat thing to remember about an orbit in uh, an isotropic field is that if you scale it using geometrical scales then the force vector is just minus the R vector, the position vector. So um, wherever you are in this thing uh, the force that you're feeling, very small as you approach the center, getting larger as you move away linearly, is just a vector pointing opposite to the position vector uh, that locates it. And uh, therefore, the uh, two or three dimensional uh, equation written in vector notation is as, as stated here. And then the idea is that uh, if you let that thing go, it would just oscillate back and forth between that and that. If you had a, 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 a mass here that could move freely, and here I'm indicating a little tunnel uh, through the thing, so this is 
making it a little bit more realistic so that uh, somebody might be able to actually ride a tunnel if the earth weren't so damn hot in the center there. Um, you, you, you would again have something that would oscillate uh, back and forth in unison with this thing. So the two would follow each other, presumably uh, just a little either collide or pass, and then continue out the other side. So when we work out the uh, frequency of the oscillation uh, that occurs inside there, um, th that is independent of wherever you start or whatever amplitude you use. That's the characteristic of a, of a harmonic oscillator. In this case, an isotropic one, where each dimension, x, y, or z, uh, has this uh, total energy. It has this Lagrangian. This is a, 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 a Lagrangian with a potential. And um, the mv squared and the kx squared, the fact that you can write the thing as a sum of squares, that's uh, uh, what leads to a really nice derivation of uh, the equation of motion without using um, very little calculus and no differential equation uh, is, is mentioned uh, uh, in the, this particular generate, uh, to, uh, derivation. And um, I'm going to do the same thing um, <clears throat> with a couple of things uh, during this lecture. So um, this is where we uh, begin. Uh, in fact, we're almost done with the derivation once we've done this. This is another example of that scale, a circle out of an elliptical uh, structure. We had an ellipse that defined our um, super ball collisions. And uh, then we, uh, we scaled that with a square root of, of mass uh, to get a circle, which we called the Strangian. And then if you scale it with the whole mass, then you get the Hamiltonian. So that geometry of ellipse, circle, and then ellipse that's uh, uh, conjugate to the original uh, ellipse is part of all of the stuff we'll be discussing in the next few uh, lectures. Okay, so uh, having uh, done that, that is having written this thing as th this thing squared plus this thing squared, we immediately assign a sine and a cosine to that. And that's kind of it. Once we've done that, we, we have, uh, have derived what we need, all that we need to know about the orbits uh, of this um, imaginary neutron star that's cutting through the uh, Earth or else. Uh, just some uh, device that somebody builds, say, a great big iron sphere uh, out in space and they let the uh, a little mass drop and it slowly moves through the center here. So it comes to that point right there. Uh, and continuous uh, if there's no friction uh, forever. Now, um, let's go ahead and finish this derivation. Um, the basic idea here is to find an angular velocity that is a time derivative of this uh, whatever angle and there's some kind of angle here, a phase angle, which is really the important part of this lecture, is finding good ways to use geometry to find phase. And do it in a way which is going to be directly applicable to the connection between classical and quantum mechanics, which we'll be getting to later, uh, later, meaning later lectures. So anyway, uh, just using this first uh, step here, um, that is the, the, the velocity um, <clears throat> that we're talking to solving this thing equal to that thing and getting the velocity as, a, as a, just a cosine times a, a square root of energy over mass uh, is the first step uh, to doing this and at the same time um, taking the velocity as a, as a derivative and doing a simple calculus trick so that we can get a derivative with respect to that a phase angle, whatever that is, and we need to uh, define that geometrically in just a little bit here. But um, that then leads us, just from our definition of that uh, angular velocity in terms of the phase angle, whatever that is, that's the thing we'll really be uh, measuring here, uh, or working with, for uh, oscillator equations, which is what we're after here. 
Okay, so that's the first part of the thing that involves just the, the ratio of the energy to the uh, constant that defines the potential, the spring constant, if you were, of, if you will, of the uh, mass inside the Earth and the gravity of providing this uh, oscillator. Uh, and then, uh, the next after that, to get that uh, lined up here, um, the uh, next thing is just take the uh, angular velocity and divide one by two, basically. Okay, so th this, this yields what we're after, the, the frequency of the Earth. What happens, what frequency is the Earth ring at, that, that's really what we're getting here. But we can make it, uh, we can make this, uh, I think, more uh, to our imagination. If you imagine, um, we'll go that far, uh, if you imagine that you um, could uh, make a really straight uh, track, uh, say a magnetic levitation track, and just set it up here, both, let's say, using a laser beam. A laser beam, except for the fact that general relativity eventually curves the laser beam a little bit, that's ignorable here. Uh, using a laser to machine a absolutely, almost absolutely uh, uh, straight and level. You'd have to get the thing uh, so it's perfectly level, okay? So that if you put the thing that's going to ride on it in the center, it sits there. And then when you pull it to the end of that thing and let it go, what's it going to do? Oscillate, just like all of the masses uh, in this thing. So let's imagine the tunnel being made, tiny little pixel up at the top there, right? It's going to have the same frequency as this one. So in 84 minutes, it's going to go 42 there, 84 back. That's kind of neat to think about. In other words, you can measure what an orbital uh, frequency is if you can make something really precise with no friction, magnetic le levitation, uh, laser machine, right, so that it rides on that track. And back and forth it goes. You can make it longer if you can afford it, right? It's still going to pretty much do the same thing. Until you've really made it long so you've got things sticking out over the earth, then, then you're uh, doing something else, right? You get another frequency. Okay? A lower frequency, right? Well, that's a good mechanics uh, problem, throw at people. What happens if you make a really perfect frictionless tra uh, track and let something go on it? All right. Okay, so the uh, that number very important, and uh, we're going to uh, work with that to build uh, basically um, what we call clock dynamics. Now, what I'm going to do next here is I want to show you um, this phasor business, this angle theta, uh, theta equal omega t. Th this is a device, a geometrical device that is really useful for studying a, a two-level quantum system. So, um, as I've said, we try to make the connections be whenever we can here uh, in this course uh, between uh, the um, classical uh, stuff, which is what is being shown here in uh, these pictures right here. But this, um, go ahead and put it up there as well, uh, this is the graphical way to, per, to calculate an orbit in the sophomore physics Earth, or the orbit uh, that occurs um, in, well, there are all kinds of things that connect to this, but this is, this is really looking at the structure of the group U2 symmetry that you have. Uh, for a two-dimensional object, or a two-degree a, a two free, a two-level system. And um, just to give you an idea uh, of uh, how that works, uh, there are, uh, let's see if I've got this, the simulation uh, connection is uh, down here. Uh, just to get this thing uh, moving, I think I can 
hope for it to come up here. Yeah. Okay, so the, these are two clocks running at that frequency, omega. This is a, pl a plot here of the y position versus the velocity y. Now that's an action diagram or, or, or plot uh, here, uh, coordinates versus velocity. Um, that's part of a, uh, it's another way to say phase. This, this is a certain phase of the oscillator that goes uh, in the along the x coordinate, and this is the oscillator uh, for the y coordinate. And uh, here's x and y uh, of the uh, orbit that is occurring uh, due to the uniform motion. And uh, all that's, the, that's different here is that uh, the uh, phase of the thing, of the um, of one of them is uh, 15 degrees behind the other. So this has a delta alpha called alpha the uh, the, the initial phase. Uh, that is what's giving uh, the orbit in uh, the time. This is the time. Both of these are the time. One of them is just set uh, 15 degrees uh, behind the other. So. Depending on how you set a, a, a clock like that, depending on how uh, the phase uh, is set, and um, you go ahead and run this one to see it on this side here. See if it bring it back to this is a really neat tool for a lot of things. If you're doing any sort of uh, polarization analysis, you know, dealing with elliptical polarization. This is a graph that tells it all. And uh, this idea of plotting position versus velocity, or position versus momentum is actually what they call phase space. But uh, position uh, versus the velocity divided by the angular frequency, we'll see uh, why that, that has to make a circle. But um, the uh, basic idea of all of our quantum mechanics is what's behind the scene are a bunch of clocks and they're all left-handed. They're all liberals. They're all uh, going in this direction. You, have, you see that has to be, if I'm going to call this the position as a positive and this the velocity as positive up, then when I'm at the top of this thing I've got to have a positive velocity. That means I've got to go that away, right? So. All of the uh, phasers that lie behind quantum mechanics have a left turn. Then they go clockwise. Now, engineers, when they're dealing with phases for electrical machinery, they're almost always using the right hand. And if you look at all of your exponentials for time behavior in quantum mechanics, they're all e to the minus i omega t. Minus is left handed. And we, we did in unit two very shortly because we do a whole bunch of things with complex variables. But this is really an important one right here. This is the imaginary axis for a phaser. Imaginary is just the velocity divided by frequency. Okay, is that that's kind of what we're going to be dealing with here. Does that make sense? Now Depending on how you phase these, these two, you can make a right-handed orbit or uh, this particular one right here is, is just exactly that. This, this orbit here has a right-handedness to it. And this uh, ellipse up here, plotting the velocity, you notice it's plotting x up and y this way. If I take that and rotate it so vx is horizontal and vy is the I get the same ellipse as that one in this particular case where the two faces are the same size. Okay. So that, that's a really nice, um, not terribly simple, but it includes all of the information about the, a two-dimensional oscillator. Now with this particular thing, it's a three-dimensional oscillator. So uh, what, what, what is missing here? Well, all of the orbits 
that you can possibly make inside that sphere are going to be uh, ellipses in a plane that is two-dimensional. And it's isotropic, so no matter where I put that plane, I'm doing the same physics. So all we need is this two-dimensional plot to deal with this thing, which is the isotropic harmonic oscillator. Now, later on, we're going to talk about changing the spring constants for one or two of those dimensions. Um, that will really occur in, in earnest in uh, Unit 4. But uh, for now, uh, the isotropy uh, allows us just to deal with the plane geometry of ellipses and uh, phasor circles. Okay, then. Now, um, I think uh, th this is one that you can uh, play with and change. Uh, <clears throat> just by clicking on a thing, you can change the starting point uh, to anything you want. You make it a smaller uh, clock. And when you do that, you get uh, whatever you get. And you can see basically this one right here is Vx versus x. And the Vx is just simply transferred, tr translated over to the Vx that's there. This one has Vy uh, pointing this way, so it, it translates up uh, to this one. And then x and y here each translate this one here, the y translating to that y, this x translating to that. So there's another ellipse. Uh, this is the spatial ellipse. This is the velocity ellipse. Again, I turn this thing by 90 degrees. It, it lies on top of that one. Okay. Now that particular feature, we're going to use another kind of geometry to show that. But uh, just to get you used to, this is the most general uh, construction for uh, using phasers for a two mass oscillating system or a two degree of freedom or two level uh, quantum system. And that's something we're really going to emphasize in Unit 4. Um, but you might as well see it now because it's, it's, it's very simple. Okay, I'm going to back out of this uh, one. Actually, I'm not have to back out of that one. Very quite, but I do have to back out of this one. So let me do that. And um, there's a very finely graphed thing that uh, you can make uh, just as easily. There's the uh, thing that we were just looking at. Okay, and here's a more colorful one. So they're the whole family of ellipses, each differing from each other by a decrement angle, difference angle of 15 degrees. And so you can label a polarization ellipse by where it touches the envelope boundaries. And this one happens to touch at 50 degrees, so that means it's got that plus or minus that difference. Okay. Now, um, this is another way to do the geometry. Call it the eccentric anomaly. This is more classical. This is more like what Kepler would have done if he had to, uh, had to solve an, an ellipse problem. Um, with a harmonic oscillator instead of uh, what we uh, have um, see if I got that on the right uh, thing. Let me um, look at and, uh, not use up CPU for that on the computer. I will um, pause this one here. So I'll take this one back. So this is the thing that we uh, do next. Um, is a geometry just straight away. Uh, I'm going to <clears throat> take uh, a typical um, a typical orbit. Uh, that is the orbit that I would get uh, if I started at this point as my high point and uh, then has some, uh, basically an ellipse that has a major radius of A and 
minor radius of p, how do you construct such a thing? Okay, very quickly. So this is a, a quick and dirty uh, uh, way to um, get the same orbit that we got uh, before. Uh, using graph paper that's got a horizontal and vertical uh, to, to it, a uh, setup to it. Um, what this is more difficult to do, to do this method is if you need to do the ellipse uh, that's skipped over like the ones that we're just looking at. But in any case, the basic idea is that it's really just another example of what we did last time. It's a zigzag uh, construction. Basically, you do a zig and a zag on graph paper. That is, you pick a point uh, right here uh, on the A uh, part and you just zig down until you're opposite the point where that line crosses the smaller radius and zag back to that and make a little uh, sort of like a, a high-heeled uh, shoe, uh, a little triangle with altitude and a, a, a sole right there. Uh, that's what you're doing uh, here. And this is just spelling it out. Uh, <clears throat> the concentric circles that determine the A and the B, that's given. And then you just draw a radius at some angle, which is the time, as it turns out. This is uh, very similar to construction we've looked at before, just to construct ellipses uh, without any uh, physical interpretation of orbiting. But here the or orbiting is, is, is a serious thing. So what we're doing is we're finding, for a particular time, where an, a particle would have been go uh, uh, starting at time equals zero, B on this orbit that is falling uh, uh, along that uh, curve, and, and there's where it would be um, at, a particular, at this particular time, T. So um, the Y is just the B cosine of that angle, and uh, I'm sorry, sine of that angle right there, and the uh, X part of the thing. Uh, is uh, the uh, cosine here. We're measuring this distance A using the same angle, but it's the cosine that's being written down. So X A cosine, Y B sine, that's all there is to this uh, construction. But what's neat about it is, and let's go ahead on both of these uh, to a picture that shows a number of the uh, solutions all in sequence there. The, um, get the clicker here to make this one go ahead as well. Uh, you can see basically what it looks like if I just put my hand on, on this thing. And as I go along here, as time advances uniformly, the angle for this, and you can, you can see that uh, here uh, it's moving fairly slowly along that curve, but it picks up speed each of these equal time variables. Uh, not much happens in the first one, but then a little bit more and a little bit more, and now it's, it's, it's really going at its maximum speed right there. So we're looking at uh, what we're going to discuss in a bit here, the Kepler's law uh, for um, equilibrium equal time will show out of this geometry. So basically, uh, starting uh, from the apogee, that think of apogee, uh, the high point of the orbit, the, actually called the aphelion, it falls to the perihelion. There's the perigee uh, right there. And then it continues falling. Now uh, it's slowing down. Here it's falling to its lowest point in the orbit, closest to the Earth's center. And then it uh, uh, slows down as it reaches back again to a high point on the other side of the orbit. So that, that's, that's uh, uh, something that you, you saw happening in the previous construction, that the uh, high point was where it was slow, and then as it passed the center very closely, it was really uh, going quite fast. So that's all um, you know, being done by this, uh, this geometry. And um, there it is. Okay, now, the calculus that goes with this. That's the next step here, which uh, is the, you know, there's so many different sides to this story, but they're all uh, quite um, 
important for different reasons. There's no um, Swiss Army knife uh, for physics. You, you try one uh, technique and you get another tool uh, to, to, to further uh, your discussion of the same thing. And you learn a little bit more each time you do that. That's uh, the, kind of the philosophy of doing all of these uh, uh, weird um, ways of looking at this. To start off here with just the analytic geometry, the algebra that goes with the analytic geometry, a radius vector for a position. I'm, I'm sitting here at a particular uh, position. That's the position vector for uh, this particular moment. Uh, whatever time uh, gives me this, whatever, and now I'm using the letter, uh, Greek letter phi for that um, time frame angle. Um, I mentioned this was the mean anomaly. If a Kepler had done this, that's probably the name he would have given it. And then the eccentric anomaly uh, is the actual position. So um, the uh, A cosine phi and the B sine phi are built into that particular uh, coordinate uh, there, the zigzag uh, for the actual position. And um, the next thing to look at is the velocity, the first derivative. Well, calculus tells you that very quickly. Derivative of cosine is plus sine. Derivative of sine is minus. Uh, <coughs> derivative of cosine is minus sine. So, um, and I also pick up an extra frequency factor here. Uh, we're being geometrical here, so we're going to imagine when we draw these pictures that omega is equal to one. So then I don't have to put the omega outside of, of this uh, particular one. So what I get here is a sine of omega t. And um, it's a minus sine of omega t. So that's the cosine with the phase shifted upward. Same thing uh, for this one. Both of them have the phase shifted up by exactly pi over 2. So the mean anomaly, the phi angle, uh, has been rotated by pi over 2 in order to get me the velocity. Okay, the velocity was the thing that was being made in the velocity plot in our first look at the phasor diagrams. But this is a completely different way uh, to think about these two. So here's this thing and we're taking omega equal to 1. So this has um, this position right here is just what's going to happen to this thing a quarter cycle later. Okay, and then we go one more step. The change in position is velocity. The change in velocity is acceleration. So, the uh, this is where the force, uh, the, uh, the, the Newton two will, will show up here. F equal m a. This is the force divided by the mass is actually what we're writing here for the acceleration vector. Again, all of this is with omega equal to uh, one radian per second. So uh, at, this, at this point, of course, the second derivative picks up an extra factor of omega squared, which would be on this thing if omega were some other value. Okay. Now, the, the next uh, step, there's one more step here, and then we're done for the harmonic oscillator, and that's acceleration. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a, it's a change of acceleration that NASA that, gave us a name for that. It's in the uh, uh, Handbook of Astronomics. Uh, the uh, jerk, J, okay? Now it's omega's third power, uh, but we're just making a vector here that's minus the velocity. This uh, particular guy uh, right here is just minus. But the way to look, think of it is, um, it is the phase angle. Now is at uh, 3 pi over 2. This one is at exactly pi. That was the first one. The first stop here was at pi over 2. Okay? So, uh, we're done, but we need to put one more in here, and this is a bad joke. Um, the uh, change of jerk, uh, I call it inauguration for lack of any other uh, political naming. Okay? Uh, we've just had, I think, uh, one uh, a really bad case of that uh, in the recent inauguration. But um, 
now we have the fourth power of omega if omega were not just equal to 1, which we're taking here. So this one is a full 2 pi and it's start over again. Okay, so the fourth derivative is just equal to the original position if omega is equal to 1. So that's the uh, story uh, for this and I haven't been following very well on this screen or on this one, but let me get all of that uh, so it's in position to be read clearly. Alright, any questions about that? Now, in this class we'll always, whenever we have vector derivatives of time, use a dot. If it's a spatial derivative, uh, we will use prime. That's shorthand that makes uh, for um, less writing. Uh, I recommend that notation. Okay, anything uh, you can think of that uh, doesn't make sense here, this is uh, fairly, uh, trying to make it as, as clear as possible. Okay, so uh, th this is kind of an interesting one to go ahead and look at it uh, on um, your know, computer uh, linkage. And um, that, is, I'll go ahead and do that right by just clicking on this one. Actually, maybe I should try to uh, do it on the um, center screen here. It's bigger. Um, I'll go ahead and put this guy up here. Now this one doesn't move with time. You have to move it. I'm going to run the time here and that is what you see. It's kind of a beautiful uh, changing of the various vectors that are uh, in that uh, motion there. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, let's see if I've got uh, that. Yeah, I think that's right. Like that. Now this this is something else. I'm, I'm realizing this is this is a, something we haven't really talked about yet. Um, I, I I apologize for that. Uh, let me back out of that. Um, that there the uh, thing that I really. Uh, need is, um, let's see if this one is uh, where, where I, yeah, this is, this is better. This one, um, whoops, that's uh, the other thing I want to show, but um, it's, uh, let's see if I can, see if uh, something weird is going on here. Yeah, you're in your presentation. Or you never left the presentation. Okay, it just advanced your page and then yeah. Let me let me uh, go back here uh, just a little bit. Yeah. This one it, it should be uh, the uh, picture of, the, of this. Yeah, there we go. So th th this one uh, is showing those. Uh, vectors moving uh, as the uh, time goes on. Okay. So that, that's kind of all four derivatives, including starting with a zero, working up to the third. Okay. Now, the, the way, the most, uh, I think, useful way uh, to look at all any of these um, harmonic oscillator, multi-dimensional harmonic oscillator pictures, any of, of these. Um, this is what we're looking at right now. This one is perhaps uh, the uh, most telling one that I think. This is uh, you know, a, an app called Boxit that we made uh, just to show things like this. And uh, here we have uh, a little molecule vibrating, so this is, is also used to describe vibrational motion of two masses, each in one dimension. But uh, here is a picture of what we're doing in the sophomore Earth with two dimensions and one mass, we're making an ellipse. And um, this thing lets you uh, pick uh, any um, initial position and whatever velocity you want to uh, give it, uh, whatever that is, that will 
then produce an ellipse, and there's a very near ellipse like the one we, we first made. And um, the uh, app lets you go ahead and erase the paths uh, that you made and start over. Uh, there's a, the picture of the typical orbit. And the potential lines, the equal potential lines of the uh, harmonic oscillator in two dimensions, in the isotropic uh, harmonic oscillator, has perfect circles for the level uh, curves for the uh, energy, potential energy. So th this is a you know, really nice uh, way uh, to des describe all, all, all of that. Now, um, I'll go ahead and go ahead on the um, was here. And this is the one that I want you to uh, see. And um, I'll go ahead and advance that one down there. So I have a static image uh, down there of this particular one. And I will uh, see if I can get the moving image of this uh, going uh, right here. And I think this, this would uh, will do that. I hope it, it's set up with the right parameters. Yes, there we go. Okay, now, when you look at that straight on, that is, if I set this thing up, say, with um, an initial uh, ellipse, it's very narrow. So suppose I make a fairly narrow uh, ellipse here. Drag the thing down here, make it nice and large. But, you know, kind of narrow. Whatever the nervous system, uh, networks are in your head immediately give you the impression of something rotating uniformly but coming out of the screen. Did everybody see that? Does anybody not see that? I think everybody is wired uh, to see perspective. And you remember when we were talking about the perspective inside the uh, schoolroom, right? Uh, there are scalings going on there that do that. Here the scaling is real the thing is really going fast when it passes the, near to the uh, center of force. Like right now, it's really going, and then it slows down out here. Okay, that's Kepler's law. But Kepler's law is just projection of something that's uniform. Or if you stand on uh, the beach, would have a lighthouse, and then and it's it's just the dusk and you can see the beam coming, right? It goes like this, you know, it's out there taking a long time. And then all of a sudden, it goes right by you real fast, right? And then it slows down. That's just projection. You look at this thing from the, if you can get to the top of this uh, picture here, uh, it's just uniform motion. So that's, that, you know, these are things to, to notice about um, just simple dynamics in two dimensions. This very harmonic, uh, isotropic, perfect, very high symmetry uh, type of motion we're talking about. Okay? So the uh, three uh, derivatives, or the four, if you want to count the initial zero derivative as a fourth derivative, they're all taking their turns there. Well, I, I would say that if we taught calculus with things like this, we wouldn't be quite as hated a subject. And that's really the objective of all of uh, the things we do here. Try to make uh, the uh, presentation of difficult concepts appealing. And the computer sure help. Okay. Um, any questions about this? These are all, of course, things that are easy to play with uh, when you um, pause it so I don't gobble CPU for other things that we um, might need to do uh, today. And I will back out. And uh, back out. Okay, uh, let's see if there's anything else to mention. This is just a picture which I'll Something we're going to be doing later, very quickly.
and that is that indeed, as your head tells you, that's some kind of rotation. And there is a way to characterize every one of the different ellipses by points on a sphere. And when you do that, there's a little thing called the spin vector that points out all of the different elliptical orbits. And it just rotates. That really does just rotate. And I'll go ahead and just run this one uh, for the sake of it. But this, this is a case here, first of all, where that's changing, but I just noticed the uh, Stokes vector is not turned on here. Let's go ahead and go to the controls just so you can see how you do that. Last um, column, second from the end. There we are, right here. Draw the Stokes vector. This is John Stokes in 1863. Figuring out all of the mathematics that you use for the spinner analysis of quantum mechanical spin. And it's totally classical. Uh, for the uh, thing. So let's just reset time equals zero here and see if I can show the Stokes vector. Make the sign one go away. I Make the what? Go back in your control panel. Yeah, let's see if I... Uh, I'll pause. Go back to control. And then at the bottom it says base cosine function. Uncheck that. Okay. That should have detailed it. Yeah, write that one down. It's already taking a picture. Yeah. Um, let me uh, resume here. Where is it? Is it is it? There we go. Okay. So what this thing is doing is just tracing out a little spin vector. This is spin precession, mag nuclear magnetic resonance, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about in Unit 4. Uh, because now it's not an isotropic oscillator anymore. It oscillates more quickly where the topography lines are close together and the gradient is high to, and more slowly where the gradient is low and you have big space between the topography lines. So you get Lissajous patterns over here, which are just what that thing would like to make except it's stuck on an ellipse. Here it's making different ellipses as time goes on. So this is what we have with the non-isotropic uh, two-dimensional oscillator. It's complete copy of quantum mechanics um, mathematics, but done in a way that's more understandable. Okay, enough of that. We've got uh, more fish to fry here uh, very shortly. And that is, I want to look a bit at the Coriolis centrifugal stuff. This is a, compared to what we're going to do later in chapter 12, which is coming up in the next couple of lectures. Uh, there we make Coriolis a little less confusing. But if you state it um, in the pictures that are, are going here, um, it is um, still pretty simple. And um, that I will put on uh, both of these screens. Here are two situations that involve a mass in an isotropic oscillator executing a circle or a near circle. We have an orbital velocity of an earthronaut. Somebody is riding in a capsule in a evacuated a tunnel. Uh, there's a perfect circle or near perfect circle around um, part of the Earth that's it's well below the surface uh, while going here. And the idea is that riding on that, you would be weightless. Basically, the gravitational force and the uh, centripetal, the center, f uh, centrifugal, center fleeing force. This is the centripetal force. This is the centrifugal uh, that um, we'll be talking about in a little bit here, and that's uh, m omega squared r. Uh, that cancels, so I'm weightless. <clears throat> and um, this case right here is doing the same thing. But the carnival kid is thing is, oh, I'm going to hold on here. I get tremendous. I feel that force. I let go. I'm going to fly off the straight line in the direction of the uh, its current velocity. So those two uh, things are at work here. And then when you go to an orbit that's eccentric, elliptical, um, you get to see these forces uh, uh, working uh, all at once, and they're. The thing that we'll be doing, we'll be discussing the, both the centrifugal and centripetal 
uh, mechanics, but as well as the Coriolis, which comes next here. And I'll put it on this screen just for the uh, uh, sake of making it uh, visible not easily. There is some weird light lighting going on there. But either one of those uh, should work. In any case, this is if you're on a merry-go-round and um, you have a velocity toward the center of the merry-go-round along that path right there. And this, this computer has got a weird sort of graphic uh, anomaly, which I find going away on this newer one. So I'll use it. Uh, the um, idea is as you move in uh, from th that there's going to be a Coriolis force, either the mathematician's Coriolis force, which is um, what the mathematician, remember, holds it back, okay? So uh, they, to keep the thing there requires a force uh, that's this way to hold it. This is where it wants to go because it had lots of velocity out here on the rim, okay? And it, in order, if it was going to keep that velocity, it would be taking off in that direction. So the physicist's force, which is the thing that tells you where M wants to go, uh, is in the right direction. And then as you come back, they're reversed. Okay. In order to get this thing up to speed, okay, and that's what uh, this force indicates uh, would be happening uh, if you continue along this straight path here. And that's the, the, the force to keep it from uh, deviating uh, from that. It wants to deviate this way, as indicated by a little da dash there. Okay, so there. What we need to do it, um, is when we develop our Lagrangian mechanics, it's going to make it algebraically so easy to deal with these. But when I do it this way, eh, it takes a little bit of work. In particular, when I start naming this vector a Coriolis force, and there's total inertial force, all of that. Um, needs to be fixed so that it's something that you can uh, trust uh, and uh, feel good about as you uh, work with these uh, things. So um, this is all uh, mechanics that is uh, going to be coming uh, uh, fairly soon. We're going to uh, introduce the Lagrangian Hamiltonian early uh, in this thing. So here's a case where you're getting the same vectors as you're rising. Uh, here you're uh, falling. Okay, um, there they all are together. And I say, quite confusing, discussion of Coriolis would be done uh, more elegantly uh, using um, the French and the German methods. The French being Lagrange, the German being, uh, I'm sorry, the French and the uh, Irish. We'll get to the German one uh, much later, uh, which is <coughs> Riemann uh, equations. Okay, now, um, these are the invariants, things that don't change uh, when you're riding on all of these gadgets. And um, that is, I think, uh, really important. And the first one that, that doesn't change, and this is kind of neat, the area of a triangle made by R and velocity, that is, R cross V over 2 the area of that dark blue uh, triangle there. Or a rectangle that's made out of the two hypotenuse to hypotenuse. Uh, that's a rectangle, but most of the time it's a parallelogram or a fat rectangle or a parallelogram rhombus, a, a point of uh, whatever you want to name the geometry that indicates what a particular time. So, just to see that, that's something you can do very easily if we know uh, what the position and velocity components are. I'm just taking uh, what we've already uh, written down for the uh, velocity on the isotropic uh, uh, oscillator uh, elliptical orbit. And that works out the nice big constant. A, B, the uh, major axis of the orbit times the minor axis and the frequency. That's kind of a nice thing uh, to know. Now the angular momentum of this uh, thing, this is the definition of it, that's something we'll, we'll be deriving more elegantly. Uh, R cross V, but something you already know from sophomore physics. Uh, the, the, those uh, quantities, let's just 
uh, stay uh, a little bit quiet here. Um, our cross view, remember that is um, the product of the this and this, and the sine of the angle that gives you um, an area of a of that particular figure there, and, um, and the, the idea is, is that uh, all of these quantities, area of the triangle, angular momentum, and the area swept, that's what we're calculating right here, that is uh, uh, changing, but it's changing linearly with time. So where, wherever you started in a uh, later time, uh, you have here an integral of r cross v over 2, well r cross v over 2 is a big fat constant, and so you put that in and bingo, uh, you just have the angular momentum uh, times the time. Now what's interesting about all of these is this isn't just the oscillator, uh, uh, oscillator that does this. This is uh, something that's true for all central force, that is isotropic force laws. Take any force law that you can um, make isotropic uh, and this will be uh, satisfied. And these are constants of the motion. Okay. And uh, let's see if there's anything else I need to say uh, here that's worth... Basically what this is saying is in one period you, this thing uh, for the ellipse orbit uh, it is, uh, works out to be this area on the ellipse. That's just the area of the ellipse. A, B times pi. Pi R squared, but now R squared is replaced by A times B, the two radii products. Okay, let's see if there's... Um, if you stick in the formulas we've already derived from the sophomore Earth discussion, uh, putting in the, the constant, that's, that's back in lecture six. So um, that is um, what's the, at the bottom of this particular thing. And let me keep this one going as well. Okay, now the next thing I want to show here that has to do with this is the, um, it, the, the use of the angular momentum invariance and also the energy invariance in these uh, objects, in these <coughs> objects of motion here. The, um, having this area be a triangle. Now, as I say, in uh, Unit 5, we do the Coulomb. Coulomb requires just a little bit more finesse than I want to have at this particular moment. But uh, for this this one, the um, this area of a triangle, A times B, and then there are the actual uh, MKS constants that go for the sophomore physics Earth, uh, that um, is definitely a nice formula to have. This one is just a little bit different. It's got the inverse square root instead of just A. And uh, we'll uh, be deriving that uh, later on. And uh, let me put that up on the screen down there. And uh, the next thing, angular momentum that's being conserved here, that um, <coughs> quantity that we did just uh, I took and then took from uh, the lecture six, that has the MKS values. This uh, here depends on the total mass. You're outside of the Earth now for the Coulomb orbits. Inside the Earth, you're, you, you, you use the density, the square root of the density as a coefficient uh, for the uh, angular momentum. Okay, this one you use the, the mass of whatever it is you're orbiting uh, to calculate. Uh, the orbital angular momentum L. Okay, so that's um, worth uh, noting. And then the area swept, this is uh, kind of neat as well. Uh, area swept, comparing again uh, what we've just derived uh, for the isotropic oscillator to uh, what's coming uh, for the uh, Coulomb uh, orbits. Now this this uh, is kind of uh, interesting here because uh, you'll notice that the B cancels, but you don't get uh, um, well here the A B cancels because uh, what we're talking about is uh, measuring of a period. Let me carry that uh, completely out. There's cancellation marks, okay, 
So for the this guy right here, the uh, time for one period is totally independent of the shape of the ellipse, no matter where you throw something, uh, whether it's on a straight line in this classroom with a perfectly uh, straight plane, or whether you're actually going all the way through the Earth uh, without friction, as a neutron star might do, and uh, have no function of A and B at all. But for the Coulomb orbit, it does have a function of just A, not a function of B. So that, that's worth noting. Now we've got energy to talk about yet, but this is the angular momentum uh, and the timing. Both of those are related very closely, and uh, you can see uh, the difference between these two um, in the sense of this one being a constant and that one being dependent on only the major axis. Well, it turns out energy does that too, as we'll see in the next uh, go here. So let me move ahead to that. This is kinetic energy plus potential energy, the total energy. And now, here's what I want to spend some time um, today just getting a start on, and that is these are quadratic forms. So with an oscillator, that's the potential energy. There's the very simple diagonal, diagonal and uh, unit, basically, product of the unit matrix. Same with a mass. Okay, so these are really simple quadratic forms, but uh, the, the, the idea uh, is what I'm, I'm trying to generalize this idea a, a little bit here. In any case, when you add up all of the uh, various pieces, uh, given what we know for position and velocity, uh, it, it uh, becomes uh, very simple. Um, that is, it becomes a constant depending on A and B. And it's a squared plus b squared uh, with the omega squared. So uh, that I, um, I point out uh, here uh, right now. <clears throat> okay. So the um, question is, what does Coulomb do? Just, just for curiosity's sake, uh, that's worth noting. Um, <clears throat> this particular frequency for the period, not a function of V or A, uh, but uh, for uh, Coulomb orbits, as we'll see, uh, that adds up to uh, this particular thing. That is, it adds up to something that is just a function of A. The major axis determines the period and the total energy. Uh, for here, no constant, no A and B uh, involved at all. Okay, so that, that's that. Okay, now, um, the rest of this uh, lecture today is, is somewhat mathematical, and since I want to make clear uh, the geometrical uh, structure that lies behind a quadratic form, but just what lies behind when you use a matrix to move a vector. Where does it go? Um, that's the first order of business here, which we definitely uh, want to get through. Uh, whether we have time for some of the more intricate things of this is, um, remains to be seen. In any case, all of this stuff is, is in the text box. I'm trying to present it uh, more, uh, um, shall we say, uh, clearly, that is, step by step. When we say we generate an ellipse with a quadratic form, well, we just have some kind of matrix here, and then we have R, the vector R on both sides here. And uh, what you're doing, of course, when you work this scalar product out, is get the equation for an ellipse. That's assuming A and B are real uh, values of a radius of a major and minor part of an ellipse. Now the inverse matrix also has a quadratic form that instead of having the a squared b squared in the denominator, it has a numerator for whatever variable p is. And p has some connection to momentum, but not quite in this, in this particular stuff that we're doing here. That will come uh, in the next lectures. But um, I just wanted to make sure we see um, that these are two different equations. Uh, for uh, an ellipse. 
and that the quadratic form or its inverse uh, is get, taking you from R to P or from P to R. Now, how does that work? How does what's actually happening uh, when you uh, do that uh, tr transform from R to P? Okay, so here is an, an ellipse right here. There is R. Well, it turns out there's this little uh, square right here. And basically what you do uh, somehow is uh, Q uh, takes R up to P on an, another ellipse, the, uh, the ellipse that goes with the uh, um, inverse of the quadratic form, that is um, this guy right here. So there are two ellipses here, one for the original one and the other one uh, for the Q inverse uh, ellipse. So it's a transformation from being here uh, to being there. And the idea is, and that's what we're going to see with this geometry, is a tangent uh, to this ellipse is exactly perpendicular uh, to the vector that you get by doing this transformation. So that geometry I want you to, um, you know, get, in, get, get into your mind um, as, as close as we can here. So there are... Um, a number of ways to uh, write all of this, just going through and uh, working out the um, whatever scale factor. I can rescale this factor, uh, rescale uh, this other uh, uh, ellipse. It um, has different dimensions uh, than the original ellipse if this is actually a physical uh, transformation of some kind. And so uh, it, that would uh, scale it up and uh, make it, uh, well, well, we'll just, we'll, we'll see uh, uh, what it is here. The uh, main thing that I want to show is this duality that exists uh, between uh, the, uh, the, the thing that involves the position, say, R, and then this other uh, quantity, P, and um, the basic idea being, first of all, that the dot product of those two is always unit, and the second one is that there is this orthogonality uh, between this and the tangent of this one, and vice versa. So that, that's the main thing that I'm uh, trying to uh, derive here and make uh, as clear as possible. So this is a picture uh, of that, and um, here is the actual tangent, the r dot, for the particular position, um, there's R dot where it would be if you base it in the center. You have a parallelogram here involving uh, the R here and the R dot there. And then P has the same thing. If there was a, a time associated with orbiting uh, on this, if this were an orbit, and that's why I'm using this. But the main thing to point out here is that per the perpendicular P dot, dot the time derivative uh, is zero, and the reverse is as well, as well uh, true. Uh, P, P dot, there would be a tangent there, would be orthogonal to that. So that's the, the duality. P dot vector is right here. It makes a triangle here that uh, has this particular guy uh, a perpendicular <coughs> to, uh, let's see if I've got that right. Yeah, here it is. Here's the P dot. A perpendicular to the original position vector. So th this is all of the stuff having to do with the quadratic forms, and this is the geometry that connects Lagrangian to Hamiltonian. That's what we're getting at, um, among other things here. Okay, let's see if there's anything here. And this is where we, we showed this thing already, but this is the R and the P vectors and this, um, I presume, will give this. Maybe better flipped, and we'll get the, the original one uh, instead. Let's we'll see what happens here. Um, yeah, now this is working. Uh, there are the R's and the P's doing their little uh, dance, each one of them around. Uh, one of them, if it were a Hamiltonian, would be the P, and the other one 
uh, is, is associated with Lagrangian uh, pos actual position and uh, and velocity connection uh, with it. So um, that, that's just this kind of a pretty uh, relationship uh, between these. And there's I don't have to pause it because it's a static until you uh, move it thing. Okay. Um, I'm going ahead here real quick. This zigzag construction where I um, start with something of an arbitrary slope, I have to pick uh, 45 degrees, but I've got an ellipse and I've got another ellipse that I get by drawing the rectangles the other way. Uh, that's the connection between the R and the P ellipse and this uh, can be continued. Uh, once I've got a particular point on the, their respective ellipses, draw another uh, vector to that, and that's going to have to be, be, a, uh, be over A. That's the effect of taking a matrix and multiplying it by a vector, is to get something that has a slope that is a ratio of the parameters of the ellipse. Um, and similarly for this one, that's the inverse. Uh, operating uh, on that same vector x and y. And, and then once we've got the thing over here, I say, well, do it again, do a zig zag again, make another shoe uh, heel uh, there, and while you're at it, you might as well do one up there. And of course, uh, it's pretty easy to show, but now you've got something that's a slope ratio squared and so forth, as I do this more and more time. Now this is the action uh, right here, the, the action of the square root matrix, the square root of the quadratic form. That's the sort of operation I need to get to the astrangium that's halfway between the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian. Literally halfway, half power away uh, between them. Okay, So the resulting vector slope has changed by factor b over a after you've done this twice, but just doing it once is a, is a very important operation. Diagonal r minus 1 uh, matrix acting on the vector, uh, whatever vector x and y, uh, is going to be accomplished uh, by that zigzag. Now as you keep doing uh, this, getting higher and higher powers, or lower and lower, actually, slope, because a is bigger than b, and up here it's the reverse, you're getting higher and higher slopes. Uh, basically, multiplying matrix over and over again is a, f is a famous technique that's used to find eigenvectors. Okay, uh, in particular the largest eigenvector for it, or the smallest, depending on which one of these you use. Okay, so at some point I've got a vector right here that's immune to either one of these matrices. So uh, that's, that's a cool uh, thing to uh, be aware of. And that's what's at work here. Um, once you see what a matrix does to a vector, and this is just with two dimensions, but you can pull the same stunt in three. It's, it gets difficult to visualize in four, but this, basically the same stuff is happening uh, in higher dimensions. Okay. Rescale it becomes a little clearer how things are working. I rescale it so I can fit the ellipse inside there. That's sometimes a nice thing to do. And uh, once you've done that, then you can follow the various uh, transformations. Now this stuff is all explained in the text, and um, it's it's stuff that helps understand what's coming in um, uh, chapter 12, but not a not a whole lot. It's not something um, that I would rather you look at the very simplest discussions of this. The idea that um, r dot is perpendicular uh, to p, and that being proved by uh, calculus. That is, the Q inverse map uh, also uh, is part of the story here. Now, if you have a general quadratic form, that's an equation for an ellipse that's at some angle. Okay, so everything we've done can be done at an angle, that's pretty clear. But doing it algebraically, that means you're going to have off diagonal components in these, uh, in not just A and D. And so uh, when you do that, then you're going to be taking a, a spatial derivative of a quadratic form, 
and uh, later a velocity derivative of the quadratic kinetic energy form. Okay, those, those will be all part of the, the story. And you'll be doing it in three dimensions when we actually talk about rotating uh, bodies and all that, uh, which there is one of them sitting right there that will be interesting later on. But in any case, this gradient, the gradient of qr squared, basically, the derivative with respect to the position of r squared would be 2 times r. That is, you reduce the power by 1. Uh, doing it in all out to see what it really does. And the result is, indeed, if you do uh, one half, the gradient of one half, which is what we had when we, we write our things one half mv squared and one half kx squared, well, that's really what that quadratic form uh, is uh, in both cases for our oscillator. Okay, so the, the sequences that you get by playing with that are, 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 are nice and interesting. I mean, there's all kinds of, of funny things going on here, the geometry is really quite beautiful in the sense that the tangent cuts the, at the perpendicular point uh, in all, each of those um, uh, uh, tr transformations. But uh, where we're headed is this. This is what we're after. Our Q, which is R squared, is going to be the mass uh, quadratic form. And then the square root of the mass quadratic form Okay, that's just plain old R. R for root. Well, this is the one that uses the root that makes this guy, which we've seen already, but um, just want you to see the connection between our Lagrangian that we use for all the super balls uh, collisions with the collision line in the bisector at 45 degrees becomes this when you just go halfway to the Hamiltonian where you go all the way where the collision line has a 45 degree, that is minus 45 degree slope. Okay. So it's this the geometry that underlies all of classical mechanics and classical mechanics connected to quantum mechanics. The geometry is still there and worth uh, paying attention to. Okay, uh, there's that connection that we need to derive and understand, and we'll be getting to that uh, next week. Okay, we managed to get all that stuff in <laughs> in a short time, but um, there we are. <laughs>